What's going on my fellow rock and rollers? Don't forget to hit the bell notification icon to be notified every time I put out a new video on my channel. Stone Temple Pilots were one of the biggest bands of the 90s and early 2000s, but to critics, they were the pariahs of the new alternative rock movement at the time. Why was this? Stay tuned to find out. Stone Temple Pilots' roots date back to the city of Los Angeles where they formed in 1989 under the moniker Mighty Joe Young. They gained a pretty big following but soon changed their name after a blues musician was found to already own the rights to their moniker. They would eventually settle on the name Stone Temple Pilots and they signed to Atlantic Records. The band quickly got to work on their debut album Core, which happened to be produced by Brendan O'Brien who coincidentally enough would work with Grunge Axe, Pearl Jam, and Soundgarden. The members of Stone Temple Pilots tempered their expectations with drummer Eric Kretz telling Classic Rock, Since we'd signed to Atlantic Records, which was one of the greatest labels in the world, I was like, if we fail and get dropped, there was no coming back from getting dropped from the top. That was my biggest fear, he'd say. Released in September of 1992 corresponds six huge songs, only three of which were actually released as singles, that are still staples of rock radio to this day, including Sex Type Thing, Creep, Dead and Bloated, Plush, Wicked Garden, and Cracker Man. The album would peak at number 3 on the Billboard charts, selling over 8 million copies, and became the band's most successful album of their career. The album was also helped in part by MTV, who heavily promoted the videos for Sex Type Thing and Plush. While the band had a lot to celebrate, critics were split over the group. While the album did garner some good reviews, the band also received some pretty harsh criticism. Music journalists claimed the band ripped off grunge acts, which were popular at the time, most notably Pearl Jam. Others contended that the band was a creation of the record label to cash in on the popularity of the alternative rock scene, which was spurred by bands from the Pacific Northwest. The members of Stone Temple Pilots weren't even from Seattle, as they all hailed from different parts of the US and eventually met in California. The band was also slammed by some critics who accused them of glorifying rape with their song Sex Type Thing, which was released as the first single from Core. It was ironic given that, according to frontman Scott Weiland, the song deals with abuse of power, macho behavior, and society's attitude towards women, often treating them as objects, he'd claim. Entertainment Weekly's Deborah Frost wrote in her review of Core that Stone Temple Pilots' hit Sex Type Thing could be Mike Tyson's rape defense transcribed into grunge rock. It's unclear whether STP, which sounds like it has crash landed Pearl Jam into Alice in Chains, is condemning or identifying with its narrator. With a real point of view, this band could be bigger than an accident, she'd claim. While The Village Voice would say that the band didn't really stand out from their peers, despite their best power chords. Even the hit MTV show Beavis and Butthead had one episode where both of the show's characters are watching the video for the song Plush and mistake it for Pearl Jam. They would go on to compare Scott Weiland to Eddie Vedder, with Butthead concluding both bands suck, while Beavis would fire back saying Pearl Jam doesn't suck, they're from Seattle. Even Saturday Night Live got in on the ribbing, as you can see David Spade discussing the band on his old segment Hollywood Minute. And in music, Stone Temple Pilots were on tour. They were great the first time I saw them when they were called Pearl Jam. It wasn't just critics who threw mud at the band, as even their tour mates, the Butthole Surfers, also threw some shade their way. During an appearance on Headbangers Ball in 1993, Butthole Surfers Gibby Haynes poked fun at the band's sound, and host Ricky Rackman made some remarks that angered Scott Weiland. Here's a clip discussing what happened. Don't tell the pilots were on the Headbangers Ball. When you hear the acoustic version of Plush, that was done on our show. It was the last time things went smoothly with these Stone Temple Pilots. One time the Butthole Surfers were on the Headbangers Ball and we were introducing Stone Temple Pilots video and Gibby says, Wow, Stone, Stone Temple Temple Pilots, who does that band remind you of? Who doesn't it remind you of? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were not happy with that and Wyland just caused a huge stink. I guess Stone Temple Pilots were really sensitive to a lot of criticism at that time. Wyland wouldn't do our show, wouldn't do a whole bunch of other stuff. We were supposed to do a 4th of July shoot with them in LA and that got squashed. The big stuff that he was supposed to do for MTV, he canceled because of what I said. My producer called me and Nancy's like, look, everybody's pissed off at you. You know, you've got to apologize to Wyland for saying that. So I ended up calling up Dean from Stone Temple Pilots and talking to him about it, and they put me in touch with Wyland. He called and apologized, and I'm sure that was you know, really awkward for him. And I basically kissed his ass. And they came back. And for the record, 
I think the new Stone Temple Pilots doesn't sound like anybody and it's good. Luckily for Stone Temple Pilots, the harsh criticisms and critiques didn't stick and to be fair, they weren't really valid in my opinion. Stone Temple Pilots popularity grew in the years that followed because rock radio, MTV and listeners embraced them. Compared to their contemporaries, the band had a much more glam and psychedelic influenced sound as it could be heard on what some would consider their best album, 1996's Tiny Music, Songs from the Vatican Gift Shop. Also, unlike Eddie Vedder of Pearl Jam or Kurt Cobain of Nirvana, frontman Scott Weiland didn't seem to reject the label of being a rock star or even hide from the spotlight as he fully embraced it. When Stone Temple Pilots were doing press for Core in 1992 and 1993, they were also quick to point out that songs like Plush dated back to 1989, which was two years before Pearl Jam even released their first song. Stone Temple Pilots was even complimentary towards the bands from the Pacific Northwest, as they pretty much drew from the same influences. And despite the negativity sent their way by critics, STP found some solace in the fact that their rock and roll heroes Led Zeppelin were also hated by critics. Dean DeLeo would tell Classic Rock, We grew up listening to bands like Led Zeppelin who got heavy criticism. When you model yourself on someone you admire and you say that they got slings and arrows too, it gives you a kind of strength. The whole mentality of STP at all times was, let's write the best songs. That's what it was all about. It was about honoring the craft of the song, you'd say. Nothing showed the sharp divide between fans and critics than Rolling Stone's best and worst poll in 1994, which saw the magazine's critics label STP the worst band of the year, while the publication's readers named them the best new band in that same issue. In 2008, Scott Weilin reflected back on the criticisms of the band, telling Entertainment Weekly, it was really painful in the beginning because I just assumed that critics would understand where we were coming from and that these weren't dumb rock songs. And in 1994, the band released their follow-up record Purple, which spawned three massive hits, including Interstate Love Song, Big Empty, and Vaseline, which slayed the critics and delighted fans. But the time between their tour to support Core and the recording of Purple spelled the beginning of the end for the band as frontman Scott Wallen started dabbling in drugs, with Eric Kretz remembering the start of his heavy drug intake definitely came towards the end of that Core tour. Before that, we were all heavy drinkers. I'd watch him drink until he passed out. He didn't do it all the time, but it happened. But that tour changed things. He learned some bad habits and unfortunately they stayed with him, he'd say. Scott Weiland would be fired from Stone Temple Pilots in 2013 and would pass away two years later, and he would be temporarily replaced by Linkin Park's Chester Bennington, who would also pass away in 2017, and Bennington would eventually be replaced by Jeff Gutt, who is the band's current singer. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and let me know what your thoughts were on the criticisms of Stone Temple Pilots as being just another grunge band, or a band cashing in on the popularity of grunge. Let me know in the comment section below guys and we'll see you tomorrow on Rock and Roll Your Stories.